Well, good morning, everybody. I'll go ahead and let you know now. Let's go ahead and turn to the book of James. We're going to turn to the book of James this morning. As you're turning there, I'm going to go ahead and, and give a little bit of introduction on the book of James. Uh, the book of James, it's a great book to learn real, everyday, practical application uh, kind of information. Of course, the whole Bible is worthwhile. Nobody would, I hope, want to take a position other than that. But the book of James is a real good, everyday, practical application kind of book. Now, uh, some of you have been doing a, um, a study or a reading here for a while. We've been reading through the book, the Bible, chronologically. If you've been doing the chronological thing, or if you just like chronology, raise your hand. I like learning that way, just period. It just makes sense to catch something from the beginning and on the, all the way through the process. If you think of a movie, if, you got, if there's any movie fans here, if they took the movie, one of your favorite movies ever, they took that same movie, cut it up into pieces, mixed them all up, and then spliced it back together and you watched it, would it make as much sense? So I really like reading through the Bible chronologically. It really helps me in my study. I'm not going to say you can't learn otherwise, but it's really helpful to at least once in your life read through it chronologically and some pieces will fall together like maybe they didn't before. So I have just a little recommendation to you on that. Uh, James, I, th I believe James is early in the chronology of the New Testament. And uh, most uh, scholars seem to, to agree with that thought. So to just place James and what we're going to be looking at today, it's early in the New Testament life cycle, if you want to think of it that way. Now, the book of James is not really long either. It's five chapters. There's only 108 verses in the whole book. And an interesting tidbit for people who are statistics kind of people, um, of the 108 verses, 54 of them have imperatives in them. And for those of you who've heard me teach before, sometimes I like getting into imperatives a little bit. That's one every two verses. That's every other verse has an imperative in it. So James, full of everyday practical application, and we get a lot of really specific direction given to us in that. So, um, and to just remind everybody, imperatives are commands. So it's important that we understand the commands, though. I mean, it's not a book or any command. It's not um, God stepping in trying to ruin our fun. That's not the point. But there's important information he wants us to know, and we need to remember he's God. So when he gives that kind of direction, we need to understand it for what it is. Now, the first part of uh, James, let's go to James chapter 1. We're going to start at the beginning. Start, we're going to read through the first, uh, the first 18 verses. The first 18 verses are, uh, cover a lot of what we do with trials and temptations, and I want us to read through that to kind of set up what we're going to be talking about today. So starting in James uh, chapter 1, verse 1, James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes who are dispersed abroad, greetings. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect results, so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith, without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. But the brother of humble circumstances is to glory in his high position, and the rich man is to glory in his humiliation, because like flowering grass he will pass away. For the sun rises with a scorching wind and withers the grass, and his flower falls off, the, off and the beauty of its appearance is destroyed. So too the rich man in the midst of his pursuits will fade away. Blessed is a man who pers perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then, <clears throat> when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Do not be deceived any, 
or <clears throat> excuse me, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. Every good thing and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. In the exercise of his will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, so that we would be a kind of first fruits among his creatures. So we get this opening, trials and temptations. Now, who in life has got to skip the whole trials and temptations thing? You never really have that issue. I mean, is it fair to say it's like every day? It's every day. So again, very practical, very practical. This hits everybody right where we have to have uh, daily, daily experiences. So picking up in verse 19, though, we're going to um, get into the next topic. So that kind of sets the stage for us in James. But from verse 19 on, we're going to get into a section that we could maybe consider hearing and doing. Hearing and doing. These, this concept sometimes causes a conflict uh, amongst Christians and non-Christians alike. It's a very important part of what we need to understand about our Christian walk, though. Uh, much of James' teaching is regarding how works should be a very important part uh, of our daily life versus just a mere procession, prof profession of our faith. Are we going to just say that we're a Christian, learn some phrases, maybe get some cool t-shirts, get the WWJD bracelet thing going on? Or by our actions, when people watch us, because they are, are we going to have uh, evidence of our faith? And that evidence of our faith is going to be more based on what we do, not what we say. You know, we've heard those kind of statements before, but do we understand that application in our Christian life? And by that, I mean our life. You know, we don't want to be um, just a Christian when we show up at church on Sunday morning, act the part, and then leave and have some other uh, things characterize our life. It needs to be an everyday, real kind of application. So in looking at this potential conflict between uh, grace by faith and works, we're going to... Um, we're going to look at some things, and we're going to see in the Bible how there's not a conflict. You know, a lot of times some Christians find conflict, and then it causes them to kind of have to go into neutral or struggle, or maybe they kind of walk away because they don't understand something. And for sure, the unsaved world, they're famous for always waving these flags about conflicts, and the Bible can't be true because this says this and this says this. We're going to today look at this and understand they both go right together. There's no conflict here. There's no conflict in God's world. In God's word. So um, Paul often teaches uh, of uh, faith by grace, which is very important. Okay, and here in James, we're going to be seeing uh, the importance of works. Okay, part of this practical everyday application. So even though Paul often taught the importance of faith apart from legalism, which many can you know confuse with works, he also taught about the importance of works. So we're going to look at some of this. Uh, flip over to the book of Titus. Flip over to the book of Titus. As you guys are flipping, I'd, I'm just curious to see a, a show of hands. Who has the books of the Bible memorized? I just wonder that sometimes when we start flipping, how drastic is it sometimes when people are, oh, hold on a second, don't... If you want to think about it, for those of you who don't have it all memorized, all the T's in the New Testament go from the biggest T's, Thessalonians, first and second, shorter word, Timothy, first and second Timothy, than Titus. So, first and second Thessalonians, first and second Timothy, Titus. So in Titus, chapter 1, in verse 16, it says, They profess to know God, but their deeds deny him. But their deeds deny him. Dene deeds are actions, they're works, they're things we do, not things we say. So here we see that that's important. We're talking about seeing here people that are being identified as people who profess to know God, people who talk a good game, but their deeds deny him. So is there a conflict with deeds, or are we seeing that deeds, things that we do, are important, an important part of our Christian walk? If we go a little later 
in Titus, we go to chapter 2. Slip over to chapter 2. Let's look at verse 7. In Titus 2, 7, it says, All things, in all things, show yourself to be an example of good deeds. Good deeds. In uh, Titus 2, 14, just a few more verses, Paul writes about Jesus, he says, Who gave himself for us to redeem us from every lawless deed and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds. So again, do we have a conflict? Or are we seeing evidence that faith by grace is how I'm here, however, I need to now have works? Not to be saved. Not to be saved. You'll never, ever, ever, ever earn it. But it's evidence of our relationship. So this word zealous, this is uh, often used but not often understood. Zealous means to be stirred to action by a strong emotion, one who is eager. So not only do we need to have good deeds, but we need to be zealous for them. We need to be eager. We need to desire to want to do that. We need to have that be part of our motivation for what we're doing. So uh, let's flip over into chapter 3 now. In chapter 3, we're going to look at verses 5 through 8 in Titus. I'll be giving you the NASB version. It says, He saved us not on the basis of deeds, which we have done in righteousness. That's what we just talked about. We're not saved because of our deeds. But according to his mercy, by the watching of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. That is how we're saved whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a trustworthy statement, and concerning these things I want you to speak confidently, so that those who have believed God will be careful to engage in good deeds. These things are good and profitable for men. Okay? Now this word careful, I mean, in English we probably understand what the word careful means, but that means to be intent on, to think seriously about. We need to have this be something that is a focus of what we do. And it's important to understand also these things, the, this last sentence in, in verse 8, these things are good and profitable for men. That word for men here is anthropos which is mankind. So it's not, a, it's not for the guys only. Okay, ladies, you're in here too. Okay, so it's what's good for all of us. Okay. Now flip back to James in chapter one. So we've seen some good evidence that in many places in the Bible, we see that works is an important thing. Our deeds are important for what we do. So in James one, Verse 22, it says, But prove yourselves doers of the word, and not merely hearers who delude themselves. So when we read these passages, we need to see the consistency between the various authors. There's not a conflict in his word. If we read something that doesn't make sense to us or seems wrong, we need to determine where the error is. You know, either I'm wrong or he's wrong, and we both know who that is, you know. Now, it may be that I just don't understand something correctly. That's fine. I th that means I need to understand it correctly. I need to learn. I need to study. I need to pray. I need to, to figure it out. There's no conflict. There's no error in God's word, okay? He tells, that us, uh, tells us that if we're saved, our salvation was a free gift, okay? We did not deserve it, but we need to be eager for good works. This topic of works is an area where there's a lot of confusion and conflict, uh, maybe you've heard some phrases that I'm going to mention here. Maybe you've used some phrases that I'm going to mention here. Have you ever got into a bait, debate about legalism? Oh, you're being a legalist. Maybe you think somebody's being a legalist, and maybe they are. It doesn't mean that that's not a problem. But anytime we talk about works, it doesn't automatically become legalism. We need to find a balance, and that's part of what we're going to be trying to do today. Is where do we find that balance? Okay. Maybe... Someone's been accused before of just going through the motions. 
or jumping through hoops or checking the box on the list. Or, you know, there's lots of ways to characterize that kind of thing. So how do I find that balance? Let's go over to Philippians chapter 2. How can I find the balance with both faith and works? In Philippians chapter 2, as I hear the pages turn, we want to go to verse 12. Philippians 2.12 says, So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but how much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That's weird. I thought once we got saved, everything was just supposed to be easy and simple. I mean, we all got our fire insurance, right? You know. But it's a big deal. It's a big deal. Now, this, this word work out, for the work out your salvation with fear and trembling, again, an imperative. So it's something we need to do. Okay? Um, not to get too deep into details of things, but there's a voice mode in the Greek, in all languages too. And this is in the middle voice. So this work out that we're supposed to do, the middle voice always makes it to the benefit of the person who's doing it. So I, this working out my salvation in fear and trembling is for my benefit. It's something I need to do, but it's for my benefit. So it's really important that we understand that, obviously. I mean, who wants to not be in the benefit line? You know, I want to be involved in doing those things. This is something we cannot take lightly or ignore. Uh, let's turn to 2 Corinthians 13, please. In 2 Corinthians 13, 5, it says, Test yourself. Test yourself to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Again, I thought this was supposed to just be like this easy, easy believism, fire insurance thing. I'm good to go and I can just keep doing whatever I've been doing. But it says, Test yourself to see if you are in the faith. Examine yourselves. Back in James, I'm sorry, we're going around a lot, but back in James, verse 19, it says, But everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to anger. For the anger of man does not achieve the righteousness of God. Therefore, putting aside all filthiness and all that remains of wickedness, in humility receive the word implanted, which is able to save your souls. It's pretty big here. Quick to hear. What does that mean, quick to hear? Is there a timer on your ear? It can't, can't mean that. It can't mean that. Quick to hear means promptly and ready. How many times do I need to be told something? Good thing my dad's not here. Uh, Wendy, shh. <clears throat> Do we have an expectation to hear God? Do I expect, and I don't mean audibly, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. When we get in his word, though, we still receive, it's new every time. Do I have an expectation to hear, or am I going through the motions? Am I just doing it because I know it's something I'm supposed to do? Or do I have an expectation? Do we prepare ourselves to hear God? What's Saturday night like for you? Again, not a ruining the fun kind of thing, but are we set our, do we set ourselves up so that when we're here on Sunday morning, we can engage this process, we can worship God, or am I just so busy with so many things that I never have time to hear from God? That still small voice, we're all familiar with that term, but do we set ourselves up where we can hear it? Or do I have so much life noise going all the, to all the time that I'd never hear it? Because we can be very busy doing good things. Okay? We often think that the decision-making process is completely revolving around, is this a good thing or a bad thing? If it's a good thing, do it. And for a lot of people, that's, that's this, as high as the bar is set. Where the reality is, is that's part of the process, but what we really need to understand is, of all these good things, should I be doing them all or can our adversary even take some of those good things and use them to put them in the way 
to where I'm so busy with good things that I have a mess and I can't really hear from God and I don't have time for all the things I need time for because I'm doing all the good things. Does that make sense what I'm saying? So uh, it's important to make sure that we um, are quick to hear. What does slow to anger mean? Well, let me ask this question. Has the word of God ever made you angry? Have you ever been, had that sense of conviction, either by something you read and now you know you're cold busted? Or maybe a brother or sister came alongside you and they have enough relationship with you that they know if they need to say something, they can. I hope you have somebody like that in your life, by the way. You need to have some people in your life that can come alongside you and go, hey, what are you thinking? Okay, because friends aren't always there to support you and tell you how great you are all the time. Really. That's a great, important part. But you need somebody who can come alongside you and have you have some accountability. Okay. <clears throat> and they should use the word. And if that's ever happened to you, but then you got really upset about that. But if they're right, they're right. If God said it, God said it. Okay. In humility, receive the word. So our presupposition needs to be that God is right. Okay. We need to receive what he says. That must always be our starting point every time. Okay. We need to take God at what he has said. We need to ensure that we don't get so busy with good things that we don't ever hear him. Okay. And if we do hear God, we need to be careful that we don't close our ears because we don't like what we hear. If God said it, God said it. And he said it for a reason. Okay? Can we think of a biblical example of somebody who God said what God said, but then somebody else said something that sounded better? Can we think of an example? Go ahead and shout it out. I heard it in the garden over here. That's where I was going, so you get bonus points. You get to leave five minutes early if you want to. <laughs> yeah, Eve in the Garden of Eden, Genesis chapter 3. Okay, The serpent said to Eve, did God really say that? She fell for it. Adam didn't really lead her out of it either. And here we are today. You know, as a side note, I don't know if you guys have ever heard me joking about this before. I, you know, our sin nature gets removed before we get there, right? Split second, boom, happens. And there's lots of good reasons for why that happens. I think one of them is because Adam and Eve are in huge trouble if that doesn't happen. There's going to be a, like a long line when I get there. Where's Adam? And yeah, yeah. Okay, so we need to receive, which means to accept, to take hold of, to welcome. Okay, so this is gigantic here in James 1, 19 through 21 quick to hear, slow to anger, in humility, we need to receive. Our attitude will make us or break us on this one. Okay? There are some choices that I must take if I want success in this area, and it's true for each one of us. Okay? The choices need to be the foundation of our life and the stuff that our life is built on. It's not the stuff that we just want to get out every once in a while and blow the dust off of. But that happens sometimes. That happens sometimes. So what are these choices? I need to be quick to hear. Am I listening? Am I prompt? Ready? I need to be slow to anger. I, I don't want to fight with God over what he has said. I also don't want to blame the messenger. Huge. Huge. Don't want to blame the messenger. In humility, I need to always believe what God has said. And I need to remember that he is God and I am not. Say that with me out loud. He is God, and I am not. And I need to receive his word. In James 1.22, it says, But prove yourselves doers of the word, and not merely hearers who delude themselves. That's pretty strong. 
Prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. Prove, again, imperative, and again, middle voice. It's to my benefit. It's to my benefit. And when you do it, it's to your benefit. Now, others who are watching also get the benefit, but the main focus here is do it for your own benefit. If you ever need motivated, here you go. Christian bookstores are filled with books. Tell me what God's will is. Okay? Prove yourself for your own, prove yourselves for your own benefit and not merely hearers. These hearers, people who hear but don't do, what are they? They're deluding themselves. Okay? Delude means to deceive, to lead astray, to miscalculate. Don't make a miscalculation that this doesn't matter. It absolutely matters. So what this verse is saying is that if we are only hearers and not doers, we have deceived ourselves and we've miscalculated. I can be my own best cheering section. I really can. I can think I'm great. I can justify anything if I really want to. Now, we're all guilty of that, too, so I'm going to go ahead and call us all on the carpet. All right? So nobody wears, it's too cold to wear sandals, right? All right. So ladies, you guys are guilty of this. You guys are guilty of this. I mean, we can justify anything, and let's, let's talk stereotypes. Okay, let's have some fun, and let's be stereotypical. Not all, but most ladies like shopping, right? And you guys have found a way to always have an excuse to shop, okay? I'm just going to say it, <laughs> all right? I mean, you have come up with one garment of clothing, and you've considered it three different ways. You've got three different names for it, so you always have an excuse to have to go get something else. <laughs> Shirt, blouse, top. Come on. <laughs> so you can always say, well, you know, I've got a shirt that goes with those pants, but I really need a blouse. That would really <laughs> be better. Okay, but just so you know, we know better. Okay? <laughs> we know better. Guys, we're not out of it either. We can justify anything if we really want to. <coughs> Tool or toy? <laughs> Tool or toy? I mean, we're going to be fair, right? Right? Now, I used to have a joke that it just depended on the price tag. Anything under $75 was a toy. Anything over $75 is a tool. <laughs> but that scale varies, you know. That scale varies. Yeah. Now, and really, the only difference between boys and men is just the price of the toy. <laughs> it just gets more expensive as we get older. So we're all guilty. Okay, we're all guilty. We've had some fun with it, but I think we understand spiritually what, what, what's being taught here. Okay, so we can justify anything, but let's make sure that we, uh, we, de- we treat this fairly. So some final thoughts on hearing and doing in light of the times that we're living in. Okay? Take time this week, and uh, if you're looking for an assignment, and read what God has said to the seven churches in the first three chapters of the book of Revelation. Okay? See how often God tells of the need to hear and to do. Okay. There's a surplus of information in there, but please keep in mind that as, uh, as we read these chapters, he's talking to the churches, and the churches are made up of people. Okay. He's not talking only to the pastor or only to the leadership team. That's commonly the first thing we think of when we read through there. And he is talking to them, but if you think you're off the hook, not so much. Okay, we're all on the hook. We need to remember that we all have a responsibility for the spiritual condition of the church, okay, and to do good works, to serve, to study, to grow, to pray. <clears throat> this is important both individually and corporately. So we each need to be doing it individually. We each need to get together corporately, like we're doing right now, to do this. Okay, Hebrews ten twenty four and twenty five. I think we're all familiar with that. It says, and let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. We're all familiar with the fact that it's getting harder and harder to go find a good church. 
okay? We probably rub elbows with people. Maybe we have family. Maybe we have friends. I know we get comments here on the website all the time about people who just have a hard time going and finding a family to have corporate fellowship with and completely understand the difficulty in that. However, it still doesn't change this. So let me encourage anybody who is struggling with a place to be, try, try very hard. Okay? The end there, verse 25, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Okay? We need to understand that the purpose of this getting together, as much as we're right now, we're in his word, we're talking, and I hope we're learning. But we need to understand that when we come here on Sunday morning, we're coming not to be a consumer, but to be a, to be a giver. We're here to worship God with what we're doing. And it's, a, it's very important that we do it individually, 24, 7, 365, but there's a time when it needs to be done corporately, and that's important. Let's look at one of the seven churches. Let's look at the church of Ephesus. Let's go to Revelation 2. Revelation 2, verse 5. In Revelation 2, 5, it says, Therefore, remember from where you have fallen, and repent, and do the deeds you did at first, or else. Or else. Oof. It's hard to ignore or else. Did you hear or else when you were growing up? Was there a finger pointed at you when you had Oreo? Yeah. All right. And as uncomfortable as that felt at that time, God is saying, do this or else. Strong. Okay. Now, earlier we had a reference to zealousness. We looked at it being stirred to action by a strong emotion. Okay. One who is eager. Now, I don't want to be too odd, but I want us to take a, a minute here. Okay. We're going we're gonna to ref- recollect. We're going to reflect back a little bit. Each one of us, I want you to do this. I want you to think back to the time when you were first saved. Okay? For some of you, that was maybe more recent than others. Okay? But whenever it was, I want you to think back to that time. What was it like for you when you were first saved? What was your experience? What was... What was going on there? What kind of, what kind of attitude did you have? And I'm leaving some pauses in here because I, I really want us to stop and think about it. Okay. What kind of things did you do? Everybody had a different experience, but there were probably some things you did that were different than what you did before. What were some of those new things that you were doing because of your new relationship, this change in your life? Do you still do them now? Maybe yes, maybe no. And there may be a good reason for either, okay? But in Revelation 2.5, Jesus to this church said, Remember from where you have fallen and repent and do the deeds you did at first or else. No, that doesn't mean you've fallen. But is it healthy for us to look back to that time and maybe remember. Maybe we were a little more motivated or excited at that time. And maybe we had some activity, some actions, um, an attitude, whatever you want to call it. And maybe that's been kind of lost. Maybe it's a little fleeting. Time and distance sometimes does that. If there's some things that you're recollecting right now, maybe you write yourself a little note on the back of your bulletin or something. Okay. James, chapter 1. We go back there and we'll look at, uh, pick up in verse 23. James, chapter 1, verse 23. 
It says, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides in it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. That looks intently. Unique word. It means to stoop down and to look at something not immediately in your line of vision. So it's not like you're walking around and it's, and it's this strobe light that's right there, obvious. It means you're looking for it, you're digging through other stuff to find it, and you're having to stoop down to find it. You're putting an effort, a big effort into it. Think that maybe like you're looking for gold. Somebody told me it was here somewhere. I'm going to find it. It's that kind of mentality. Okay? But the one who stoops down and looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides in it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. We're not going to catch it by casual effort or mistake. Okay? We're not going to stumble into it. It's not going to happen. We have to have as our motivation what I do every day. I'm going to look for it. I'm going to work for it. Okay? Now, this mirror that's being talked about, it's, it's God's word. Okay? We need to admit what we look like when we look into God's word. When I look into here, the reflection that comes back, I need to fess up. Okay? I fall short. And I need to remember who I am in this process, okay? There are folks who, uh, you've probably heard comments before, they think when they get to heaven, they're gonna have a little conversation with Jesus and straighten them out on a few things. And as silly as it seems, there are people who really think they're gonna argue with him, okay? Flip back to Revelation chapter one. We're going to look at an example of somebody who um, had a face-to-face -face with Jesus, and we're going to look at how they responded when they were confronted face-to-face -face with Jesus. We're going to look at John's experience. Okay? In Revelation 1, starting in, chapter, or in uh, verse 12, Revelation 1, 12 says, Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me. This is John talking. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man, clothed in a robe reaching to the feet, and girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white, like white wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it has been made to glow in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid, I am the first and the last. So to quote him again in verse 17, and think about who John was and all that he did and all he was used for and what Jesus himself thought of John. When John saw him, he says, when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. So I assure you, none of us and nobody we know and nobody that's ever existed is going to debate anything with him. I'm not going to straighten him out on anything. Okay. So we need to hear his word, and we need to abide in it. We need to do it, okay? Now, what happens when we do this work, when we do these deeds? When we do work, we get dirty. We get dirty, okay? If we want to grow, if I want to grow, I have to be willing to get dirty, Okay? If you've been around me for any length of time, you, it's not odd for me to make a gardening 
analogy, okay? Think about that whole process, okay? There's no way you're getting out of the dirt process, okay? But that's how things grow. And spiritually, it's no different, okay? Jesus uses analogies the same way. And if we want others to grow, if we want to see others grow, and if we want to be used in that process, okay, we have to be willing to get dirty. There's no way around it. We absolutely have to be willing to get dirty. So we can't be afraid to be hearers of the word and doers of the word. And when you do the word, you're going to get dirty. But that's how growth happens for me. That's how growth is going to happen for you. And that's how growth is going to happen for other people. Okay? If you think about a field, and the, maybe the first time it's ever going to be planted, the condition it's in right now, probably not real good. And that first work of getting in there and plowing up that hard soil is painful. There's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears involved, and it's hard work. But eventually, what comes later is awesome. But somebody has to get in there and do the hard work now. And has to be willing to be dirty in the process. So that's my encouragement. Those are our marching orders. So please join me in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for, for leaving us your word and just all that you've had to say. We thank you for, for calling us into your family and, and uh, help us to understand that you called us to get some work done. And um, we're not to just uh, wait until we see you, but um, there's a process involved. There was uh, folks that you used to, to reach us. And we pray that uh, we would be part of that process going forward and you might use us to reach others, Father. We just, um, we thank you for your word. Help us to understand it better. Help us to um, understand the intention that you, that you have when you left it for us. So may we use it correctly. And um, we just pray for all that's going around us, Father, all that's going on. We just um, pray for your plan and uh, our part in that. And we thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.